Okay, welcome to our lecture on lighting. And um, many of you have already taken the lighting course that's required. So this isn't going to go into a lot of detail, but it is going to kind of gloss over the surface. Sometimes it's nice to get information again. It helps us remember it. But for many of you, this is going to be uh, kind of a review. So let's begin with daylighting because it's one of the most effective ways to reduce energy use. Daylighting can save businesses significant labor costs because it's been linked to increased productivity in addition to energy savings. Uh, for example, when Walmart added skylights to their Eco Mart in Kansas, they actually claimed higher sales in the newly lighted areas. Shoppers commented that the skylight stores seemed cleaner and more spacious. Daylight helps us relate the indoors to the outdoors and colors will appear brighter and more natural in daylight. Variations in the light throughout the day will stimulate visual interest, and sometimes people will feel disoriented without daylight. Now there can be problems, uh, mainly glare, and it's basically, glare is a result of excessive contrast or light coming in from the wrong direction. There are several ways to avoid glare. Mainly you want to practice sensitive interior design. So assign task areas to areas with sufficient, sufficient natural lighting. Orient the furniture so that daylight will come in from the left or the rear of the line of sight. Workstations should never face the window. And windows should be placed away from focal points in the room. Imagine staring at a fireplace with a window behind it or staring at a TV with a window behind it. It's really hard on your eyes. And think about designing gradual transitions from the brightest areas to the darkest areas of the space. Okay, so there are many tips for designing for daylighting. Uh, basic daylighting could mean making windows and skylights large enough for the darkest overcast days. For the best daylight distribution, interiors should have high ceilings and very um, nice reflective surfaces. Ground reflected light is really nice because it's been diffused, but it's still bright. Take advantage of daylighting without excess heat or glare. Um, a building should be oriented so the windows are on the north and south sides. An atrium or well light can be used to bring in large quantities of light. And the sky at the horizon is actually about one-third as bright as the sky directly overhead. So the closer a window is to the ceiling, the more light it'll gather. That means things like skylights and clear story windows are very effective at capturing light. Now you don't get the view, but you do get a, a large amount of light. And using windows on more than one wall in a room can definitely help achieve a more balanced daylighting experience. So daylighting that comes through openings in the walls or, or windows is called side lighting. East and west windows must have shading devices that help avoid late afternoon and early morning sun. South facing windows are the best because um, they get the most indirect sunlight, but um, you should consider also having horizontal shading devices so that you can reduce glare. The height from the top of the window to the floor should be about one half the depth of the room if you want to reduce glare and maximize the amount of daylight. Alternatively, top lighting is light that comes in from the ceiling, like from a skylight or a clear story. Lighting from above offers the best distribution or um, diffused daylight. It offers better security and frees up wall space and provides more balanced daylighting. Top lighting provides more light per square foot with less glare than side lighting. Now the goal of lighting design is to create an efficient and pleasing interior that is both functional and aesthetically pleasing. Varying levels of brightness avoid monotony and create nice perspective effects. And grouping tasks with similar lighting requirements together allows you to use fewer fixtures and conserve energy. Another thing to think about is using movable fixtures. They work the best for task lighting and then they can, they're not permanent. They can be altered a little bit. 
Designers and engineers often have different perspectives when it comes to the lighting approach. So it's nice for you to employ a professional lighting designer to help kind of bridge that gap. Now there are several steps to the design process. First, you establish the project lighting cost and project an energy budget. Next, you do the task analysis. What do your clients need? What's going to be happening in the space? Then you can walk into the design stage, selecting the lighting system, calculating all the requirements, and preparing the drawings and the specifications. And finally, you do the evaluation. Now, this is a, re a quick review of lighting sources. As I mentioned, you get the bulk of this in your lighting course. This should be something that everybody kind of knows already. Um, but let's first talk about color temperature. So this, the spectrum is basically the complete range of colors in the rainbow from very short wavelengths, which are on the blue end, to very long wavelengths, with, which are on the red end. White light is a balanced mix of all the light wavelengths. So in, in, it's the opposite of, of pigment, where in pigment, white is the absence of color, where black is the presence of all color. And color temperature and in, in, in light color, white is the presence of all the colors and black is the absence. Sunlight is pure and normal in color and the color appearance of any object is greatly influenced by the lamp's spectrum or color temperature. Um, the clear blue sky has a color temperature of 10,000 degrees Kelvin. The higher the color temperature, the cooler the source. The CRI, or Color Rendering Index, is basically a scale of the effect of a light source on the color appearance of an object compared to its color appearance under a reference light source. It's expressed on a scale of 1 to 100, where 100 indicates that there's no color change. A low CRI rating suggests that the colors of the objects will appear unnatural under that particular light source. All right, so the most basic type of lamp is the incandescent lamp. It's essentially like a fire from a candle. Um, the glowing filament inside the bulb is, is like that candle flame. It appears redder than sunlight, and incandescent bulbs do add heat to a space and generally have short lives, about 750 hours. They're often used to enhance warm color palettes and enhance skin tones. Now, fluorescent lamps are much more efficient. Basically, it's a, it's a sealed glass tube filled with mercury, and then there's an electrical discharge between the ends of the tube, vaporizing the mercury and um, basically creating this ultraviolet light, causing the bulb to glow. The color of the light can vary depending on the composition of the, the chemicals inside. And fluorescent lamps will usually appear on the bluer side than sunlight. They have come quite a long way recently. Fluorescent lamps will provide five times the amount of light for the same amount of energy as an incandescent lamp and give off less heat. They usually have about a 24,000 hour lifespan. Now halogen lam lamps are basically compact incandescent lamps. They're efficient, lightweight, uh, lamps with a very long lifespan, or long in comparison to incandescent lamps. The light is produced by a heating filament and a small amount of halogen gas in the bulb, um, producing a brighter white light than the standard incandescent. Typically they'll last about 2,000 hours, but they must be screened because they can explode. Finally, we have the HID lamps, or the high intensity discharge lamps. And these are even more efficient than fluorescent, um, but their color rendering properties are pretty limited. So these are usually used in outdoor and industrial spaces. Now, good lighting controls give both flexibility and economy to the project. It allows for a variety of lighting levels and patterns. Lighting controls include both automatic and manual operations, and occupancy sensors, which are great for commercial spaces, help conserve energy. It's really important to talk to the people who use the space and discover how the space should be used before deciding on a lighting plan. Uh, manual lighting plans generally give employees a sense of control, leading to satisfaction and increased productivity, 
But too many options can also be a bad thing. Simplicity is pretty important. Emergency lighting is used in the event of a power failure. It provides a lit path of egress and is usually best at the base of the wall in case there's a fire and there's smoke in the air and people are needing to crawl on the floor. There's a lot of different options in terms of emergency lighting. So these are typically battery powered units, but they are also generally hardwired into the building's electrical system so the batteries can recharge. The general goals are of emergency lighting are to avoid stress and panic and to, you know, to provide a, a lit atmosphere for people. It's required at all exits and any aisles, corridors, passageways, and ramps that lead to an exit. General lighting and exit signs must be lit at all times while the building is in use. And um, it's the easiest way to provide emergency lighting is to put some of the existing light fixtures on a separate circuit designed for emergency lighting. That one uh, would be connected to like an emergency power source, for example. All right, so there are best practices in terms of lighting design. It's definitely controlled largely by code, but then there are some other things to think about in terms of aesthetics. Now, there are three illumination levels. These are very important for you to remember. Task, ambient, and accent. The best approach is to first provide the task lighting requirements and then the, determine what, if any, ambient lighting is required. Accent lighting is provided to enhance artwork and architectural elements, and it's a good idea to control accent lighting with dimmers. Use programmable lighting for exterior lighting, so light that will turn on and off automatically. And for family rooms and great rooms, um, a non-uniform perimeter lighting plan will allow for more relaxed atmosphere. And fluorescent lighting is recommended for a workspace because of the even distribution. In addition, it's, kitchens should always have some form of natural light. And general lighting plus task lighting should be provided over the countertop surfaces. Natural lighting is definitely most desirable for bathrooms, and windows also help in ventilation. You should avoid any direct sun, though, uh, towards the face, and a mirror should never be located directly opposite of a window. Vertical light that flanks the mirror or comes down on either side is the most desirable. Wall sconces and pendants can be placed in that position. Overhead lighting is very common, but it doesn't give you the best uh, view you have it creates a lot of shadows on your face so if you can if it works in your design always think about adding lights to the side of the mirror the lighting in public restrooms should vary from the rest of the building and be very well lit the toilet urinal and sink areas should be treated with task lighting in a work environment lights should be distributed rather uniformly avoiding hot spots or shadows Office lighting should feature energy conservation and have good color rendering capabilities. Fixtures located to the front or side of the employee can create glare. So a designer could decrease this by increasing the brightness of the surroundings or decreasing the brightness of the light source. Light sources should not be located behind an employee at a computer screen. For areas with computers, indirect lighting with a ceiling at least 10 feet high is recommended and selecting matte finishes will reduce the brightness. Lighting uses the most energy in a building. Now, something that's very popular are the compact fluorescents. These are great as an alternative to the incandescent lights. They last a lot longer. For HED lights, choosing a color rendering index of 60 or more for office situations or 70 or more for gen other general situations is uh, a good way to save energy. And finally, if you're going to choose the linear fluorescent, then stick with the T8 lamps. They seem to be the most efficient and use an electronic ballast. Also try to find bulbs that have a very low mercury content. All right, that's it for lighting. Now stay tuned for the next video on appliances and power plans.